Welcome to the NFL Week 14 Sunday Slate Breakdown here at Lineups. I'm your host, Jacob Wayne, joined by Cody Malmstrom and Will Schwartz. Do a quick recap of our Week 13 before we get into these Week 14 games. I went 4-2 and last week. Cody 1-1 one one on picks on here. Schwartz 4-4. Four and four. A couple of head-to-heads I want to break down, but Schwartz going to bring you in first. Uh, maybe your, your best bet, your worst bet, any other recap you want to hit from last week. Yeah, uh, let's just take a look right here. I think probably my best bet. Uh, I'm just happy about this one. Not that it was my prettiest one, but I got Falcons minus two and a half. And I I, I think I finally flipped I finally flipped on the Jets. And I wouldn't say I did it at the exact right moment because it, it should have been done earlier. But, I mean, it was the right moment as in it, it wasn't wrong. So I'm glad that paid off. A worst bet, I don't know, maybe the... But the most upsetting one was Bucks minus five and a half. I really, really, really should have had that, and it was just a tough way to lose. But my my actual worst analysis was the Eagles plus three. Thought I got a great number there, but uh, Niners, when they're healthy, are just too much for that team to handle. I'm very interested to see if that's a playoff rematch, which location it's in, and how things differ. Yeah, we went head-to-head on that Panthers-Bucks game, and the Panthers were in it throughout. Uh, at one point, it looked like the Bucks had pulled away for good, but yeah, a little backdoor cover, so love to see that. And of course, uh, the Niners-Eagles game. My most confident play of the week, My one of my most confident plays of the season, to be honest with you, and uh, yeah, financially reflected that, and certainly a good day watching the Niners. Um, looked a little hairy after the first quarter when the Niners had, I think, like minus six yards of offense, but they figured it out from that point on. And yeah, Niners definitely the best team in the NFL right now. Cody, any other recap you want to hit before we move on? Yeah, uh, best bet, definitely the Packers plus seven. I thought that was just an absolutely insane number against the Chiefs. And they showed out this Chiefs team. They have some serious issues that they got to work on the offensive end. Um, I don't know if it's naggy. It's kind of easy to pinpoint towards them. But to be honest, it's just this whole unit as a whole. Very underwhelming pass catching group outside of Kelsey. Like it's just, it's 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 rough over there right now. And Jordan loves him. He's balling out, and he finally proved it against a very very stout uh, coverage unit. Um, this is wasn't my worst bet, but it stung a lot. Saints plus four and a half. Lions didn't even deserve to win that game. I, they were absolutely gifted twenty one points to start the game. Gifted three touchdowns. Awesome field position, interception, all that. And still nearly lost the game because this defense cannot cover anything. And it's just absolutely horrific. Even Jameis Winston looked like Dan Marino out there and his minimal star. It was just, or I should say Drew Bledsoe would be a little more appropriate. It was just, it blew my mind. Just, I'm, it was horrible. And then to lose by the hook too, just ouch. Yep, getting our uh, Lions rant out of the way a little early, but we'll be talking about them oh, again. Oh, that's not a rant, baby. I got a rant coming. Uh, we'll, be, <laughs> we'll be talking about them in a little bit. I'm sure there'll be more to say about that team. But first, going to jump into the, the NFC South battle between Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Atlanta Falcons to kick us off here. Buccaneers 5-7, and seven, Falcons 6-6. Six and six. The spread has moved a little bit. Uh, it's actually at minus 2.5 for the Falcons this morning when I looked. Down to one and a half uh, total at 39 and a half points. Schwartz, I'll go to you first on this one. You were on the Bucks last week. Are you backing them again here? No, nah, I, I got to take a break from these two teams, both of them. I think they've both been a real moving target. Uh, the Falcons have looked kind of terrible. They snuck by the Jets and Saints who are not playing good football, and they lost to the Cards, Josh Dobbs, and Will Levis. Like That's their last five games. They haven't had a good showing in weeks, and you could say positive regression time, but I think there's real issues with this team, how Arthur Smith runs it. Uh, not so much the personnel is just much the way the teams run. So I, I'm not a huge fan of playing either side in this one because the Bucks, the Bucks are so enigmatic too. They have talent as well. But I'm leaning under on 39 and a half just because of how dysfunctional both teams have been against halfway decent defense so often. But if either one of these teams has one of those games, like the Bucks, every once in a while have a game where they realize they have Mike Evans and they like against the Texans, they scored 37 points. And if Arthur Smith just as notices B. John Robinson, this, this number could get pulverized. So I'm leaning under 39 and a half because that's what happens in most outcomes. But I think it's way too easy for me to see a path where that number gets wrecked for me to actually play it. This game's a no touch for me, but winner of this game is in a really good position to win the worst division in football. So kind of a cool one to watch, even if it's not a cool one to bet. 
Yeah, I love the over here. Uh, up from 39 to 39 and a half, but still under 40, which is a key number. Uh, 41 is another key number. So like this spot, but a few reasons to like this over. First of all, in a week where we're going to be talking about a lot of weather situations in some later games, this is being played indoors in a dome. So nothing to worry about weather wise there, but the Buccaneers defense has just absolutely fallen off a cliff. Uh, they're 28th in PFF coverage grades, 29th in run defense success rate since week seven. Injuries to Levante David and Devin White haven't helped. Their cornerback room has been very banged up. And even a, an offense led by Desmond Ritter, I think, can score 20 points on the Falcons, uh, on the Bucks here. And I think the Bucs can do their part offensively, too. Baker Mayfield, another week removed from that ankle injury. But the Falcons, uh, they're, gonna, they're probably going to be missing their top two defensive players. Grady Jarrett's been out for several weeks now, and A.J. Terrell, top cornerback, suffered a concussion on Sunday. Really nasty-looking hit, and I'd be surprised if he plays this week. No official word on him, but Falcons down to 29th in pass defense DVOA, which is where the Bucs are going to look to attack anyways. Their run game isn't effective, so I think Baker Mayfield is a solid game here. Look for Mike Evans and Chris Godwin props as well. I think both guys could show out in what could be a sneaky shootout, but Cody, any take on this game from you? Uh, I'm avoiding this one as well. I, if I did have to pick a, um, a side on the total, um, I do actually kind of lean the over as well. It's just, man, this just game just screams coaching malpractice. <laughs> it's so hard to trust. I, I, the Falcons theoretically should have no issue moving the ball on the ground. Um, we know exactly who they are. They want to run it. They have a very capable runner in Bijan when Bijan is being used. They now take a Buccaneers defense who has regressed all the way to 29th and rush defense success rate. That bodes especially well for the Falcons in the midfield. They'll constantly be in a position to keep moving the sticks, keep Desmond Ritter away from having to throw at farther distances on third downs, which which is massive for the Falcons offense. That's exactly what they have to do because Desmond Ritter tends to turn into a pumpkin the more he has to throw. But as you said, this Bucks defense as a whole is regressing to the point where I think Desmond Ritter could also kind of put up something competitive here. It's just... It's, re- it's really tough to decide. I am taking a hard look at this over. It's just I haven't pulled the trigger on it yet. Um, like you said, Baker, another week away from his injury. Um, he should hopefully only be getting better, and he's taking on now a regressing Falcons defense who's hampered by injuries. You just got to capitalize on scoring positions. That's all we really ask for in this game, and it'll be really intriguing uh, to see if they do so. Maybe I'll pull a live over if they kind of have a few stalled-out drives early on, but as of now, I got nothing. Let's move on to the Indianapolis Colts at the Cincinnati Bengals. Bengals fresh off of that upset win over the Jaguars on Monday Night Football where Jake Browning was inexplicably excellent. Uh, One AFC Player of the Week, Offensive Player of the Week, right, Schwartz? That's what you just said before we started recording. But curious to hear your thoughts on that Jake Browning performance and if you think he can repeat it in this game. I mean, for another couple of weeks, Jake Browning is the only – He's the most recent Pac-12 quarterback to play in the playoffs, so I wouldn't say inexplicably. But I've been saying for years that any solid Power 5 quarterback could do Joe Burrow's job, and this clearly proves it. Uh, One game sample size, don't need to see anything else. That's it. Discussion over. Uh, But jokes aside, Burrow, I mean, Browning has to come back to earth to at least some degree. I thought he looked fantastic, but we've talked about the backup bump like constantly. And that was, just, I think, his first or second full game. I think the, the book has to be at least out on him to a degree, not in terms of anyone's actually shut him down now, but just that there's there's at least some tape to work on. And I think the Colts are an incredibly well-coached football team. Shane Steichen is doing such a great job this season. I, I think he's a fringe coach of the year contender, especially if Indy can even make a division push because that race is getting fantastic. But I'm going with the Colts on the money line here. I'd be considering them even with Burrow here, not at minus 110. I'm assuming they'd be more like like plus 160 or 170 with Burrow. So I'd, I'd be looking at them in that case, but I'm definitely looking at them in what's being considered almost a pick them. Uh, these two teams are basically locked up by DVOA, and that's a lot of that statistical basis accumulated with Burrow. The Colts are way more balanced between the two sides of the football. Bengals cannot stop anything defensively, especially with the run. I think the Colts are going to be able to lean on that a little bit. Give Gardner Minshew some easy opportunities by softening up the front seven uh, and forcing the Bengals to stop to sell out to stop the run. So I think that the Colts uh, are a smash play here at essentially even money on the money line. This is not a spread game uh, for me. It's going to be a tight one. Yeah, wild back and forth game uh, between the Colts and Titans last week that ended in OT included Will Levis throwing a pick and forcing a fumble on the same exact play somehow. 
Uh, but I think Shane Sykin is more than a fringe coach of the year candidate. He's currently plus 550 on FanDuel. Always shop around and make sure you get the best odds. But I don't hate that as a future bet. I know Cody has a future bet on the Colts that he's into. But I, do, I don't mind the Colts in this game. I think the biggest thing for me is they definitely have the advantage in the trenches on both sides of the ball. The stats really bear that out. Especially now that run-stopping nose tackle Grover Stewart is back in the lineup for their run defense. And then I don't mind selling high on the Bengals after that Monday Night Football game. But, Cody, any take on this one? I think the cold Super Bowl hopes are still alive. <laughs> yeah, what a wild game. Um, and if you didn't catch your first one, um, I put a bet on the um, – or if you didn't catch your latest video, I put a bet on the Colts at 200-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl. And it's strictly just because I think they can make the playoffs. And if they do that, I'm just going to hedge the absolute crap out of it. It was a lot better value than just getting a even money to make the playoffs. Um as in terms of this case, or uh, the, uh, in terms of this game, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, definitely stylistic because the Colts, a big part of their success has been their uh, back end. They absolutely excel at um, limiting the pass. Well, Jake Browning, as much as he did kind of start flexing a downfield pass later on, we got to remember early on it was screens and just some absolute horrible play designs. But what gets really interesting, and and if the Bengals know, um, notice this, the Colts are a horrible run stopping unit, very very poor. Twenty six uh, rush defense DVOA, thirty first uh, success rate, and twenty six EPA. That's feeding right into Mixon. Now, if Mixon can get going, and kind of have to command the attention of the secondary, maybe kind of force them to a box, it's going to be really interesting to see if Browning can now pick apart these slightly wider open windows on the outside. Now that means he has to uh, throw downhill at a higher rate, which we have kind of yet to remain to be seen. So to me, that's kind of just impossible to back until we see it. I do agree that this would be the sell high spot of the Bengals because, well, it's like they just came off of a, what were they? They closed as a 10 point underdog and with an outright win. Now, granted, they got some luck with the whole Lawrence thing and all that. But if I had to pick a side, I, 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 just, I just can't good faith back the Bengals until we can see Browning stretch the field some more like this. I, I don't hate the Colts though. Uh, this Bengals defense, it's it's awful. We've mentioned multiple times before. When they're not creating havoc, they just have horrible, horrible gaps in coverage. They're letting people move the ball downfield with ease with them. Minshew, I mean, he's one of the lowest graded non-rookie quarterbacks. And I think even he's more than capable of kind of moving the ball on this defense. The number's tight for a reason, and I totally agree with it. It, it is a pass for me. I don't even have a team. I, I don't even know if I'd lean either way, to be honest, the, the more I'm looking at these numbers. Yeah, pass for me as well, ultimately. Didn't mind the over um, when it was at a lower number, but it's been seen back up to 44 now, and the weather doesn't look to be as big of a factor as was expected early in the week, but uh, it's so hard to know with these weather forecasts. We're recording this on Wednesday, so don't want to say anything definitive on that front, but I wouldn't be shocked if this is a high-scoring game. So pay attention to the weather, but don't hate an over in this one, depending on that situation. Let's move on to a game that I'm pretty excited to talk about. The Rams at the Ravens. Ravens have a huge rest advantage here. Um, they played when this game will kick off. They will have played one game in the last 24 days when they take the field on Sunday. Uh, Going to have an opportunity to get some of their guys who've been banged up healthier, but it also means some of their guys may be rusty. So, Schwartz, curious your thoughts on that situation for this team. Do you think we see a full strength Ravens outing here? Or do you think the Rams are feisty as underdogs? I mean, I like this Rams team in a lot of ways, but they have such a hard time putting it together. And you're talking about rust. that that That's kind of a less fancy way to say lack of preparation in a way. And I'm not willing to entertain that with a John Harbaugh-led team pretty much ever. Uh, this is this is probably the best coach team in the league, top to bottom, uh, in terms of the whole staff. And I, I just, I'm never going to be against them being ready. I think rest is only a good thing. He, John knows how to leverage that kind of thing uh, rather than make it work against you. I think it's time to sell high on the Rams. Three in a row is enough for me. It's been a it's been a nice little run for them, but they're they're going to go back to they, they can, it's just not going to last forever. And this has got to be the peak of the market, in my opinion. And I know this is going to sound a lot like my Eagles Niners breakdown, but we're not talking about the luck box Eagles. We're talking about the Ravens that every analytic loves. We're also not talking about the Niners. We're talking about the Rams. I don't think you can beat the Ravens in Baltimore or even play with them in Baltimore with the 21st best run defense by DVOA. In case it even needs to be said, the Ravens' rushing offense is number one by DVOA. So I just think the Ravens are going to be able to control the football, uh, just stand on the Rams all game and just control, you know, just run away with this one at home. I have the Ravens minus seven. It's 
Obviously not a perfect number, but I mean, a push is not the end of the world. If it really does come down to that, I don't think it will. Yeah, I think the spread's overinflated. Uh, I, I really like the Rams here, and Cody, I'll let you get in your cap in a minute here. But um, the Rams have only had the trio of Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua, and Kyron Williams on the field together for three games. In those three games, they're three and out, averaging 33 points per game. They've benefited from an easier schedule. Two of those games were against the Cardinals and the Seahawks, but they also just did that against the Browns, who have one of the best defenses in the NFL. What I, I, what I think the Ravens are going to do in this game, and by the way, the weather's going to be a, a massive factor here, 20-mile-an-hour winds and rain, I think the Ravens are going to run the ball. Schwartz just said, the, the Rams do not have a great run defense. This is true. But it's also difficult to really pull away and win with margin when – you're keeping it on the ground and not throwing downfield. I'm, I have some concerns about Lamar Jackson moving forward without Mark Andrews against the Chargers, who I think we all agree have a terrible pass defense. He had his worst completion percentage and yards per attempt of the season last week or two weeks ago uh, with Andrews out of the lineup. I'm just concerned about this offense's real explosiveness, especially in weather conditions. Rams, uh, now that they're fully healthy and Stafford's back as well, uh, I think their offense is... Arguably the better one in this matchup. I think you could really make that argument here with the Ravens missing Mark Andrews. And the Rams defense has some young pieces who have really improved in recent weeks, especially Kobe Turner on the interior with Aaron Donald. Really exciting tandem there. But I just think this is a, a little bit too disrespectful to the Rams to give them the full seven points. And the final nail in the coffin for me, Lamar Jackson is one and eight against the spread as a favorite of seven more seven or more points in the last three seasons. So been profitable to fade him in these spots. Give me the Rams catching seven on the road against the Ravens. Uh, Cody, what do you think about this matchup? Um, I agree with Wayne, but it's for a different angle. I think this number is pretty inflated, and that is why I'm putting the Ravens in a long teaser piece. Uh, I will gladly take a minus one over a minus seven. And to be honest, this team's kind of entering Chiefs territory as of late. They just do not cover the big numbers. They just love playing with their food, and it is mind-boggling dumb for just how well coached they are. I just, I don't understand it. Um, I do agree. This offense is going through some hiccups right now. They are sorely missing Mark Andrews. I thought Isaiah likely would have a much, much bigger role, especially as he's kind of like a more pure pass catcher. He's not a blocker whatsoever, but by not being a blocker, he's kind of now hampering the road, the, the rush attack, which the rest were the Ravens. It's their bread and butter. I, I the wind, the weather is a playing huge factor. Um, like if, when you're playing a more heavier conservative run approach, you're just, um, Living the variance, it's going to play towards a tighter number, which would play towards the Rams covering a score here. And to be honest, this Rams offense has very silently been just an, an elite unit. Like, you, like I feel like not enough people are talking about them. And it, like uh, Wayne said, it's coming kind of a very like rare sight to see when they're all at full health. Kyron Williams is also in a position to kind of shred, not shred, um, have some productive runs against a regressing Ravens rush defense, who is now dipped down to twelfth in um, success rate. If he, as, as I was saying with um, Joe Mixon and the Bengals, if Williams can keep putting Stafford in a good position to succeed here, I don't see how they kind of have any issue at least moving the six into scoring position. It might not result in the points because the Ravens uh, do a great job of bottling up inside the red zone. But, I mean, give me some field goals here in a clock run heavy game to stay within the scoring pace. I, I, I lean towards the Rams in that regard. Now, with that said, that's exactly why I'm going to take the Ravens as a teaser piece instead. Um, I just think it's a lot more security to just ask them to at least cover minus one. But yeah, I think this is going to be a, a super fun uh, kind of chess match here. Who'd you pair the Ravens with in that? We will talk about them later. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, I don't hate the Ravens as a teaser piece. Obviously, getting them down to minus one is good value, but. I, I don't know, man. I really wouldn't be stunned if the Rams pulled off the upset here. Um, Kyron Williams is one of the most efficient running backs in the NFL. Like Cody said, fifth in yards per attempt. And the Ravens do have a strong run defense, but what they don't have is a pressure unit. They can't really generate a pass rush. And if you give Matthew Stafford time in the pocket, granted, the weather conditions are not going to be super conducive to the pass, but Matthew Stafford, when he has time in the pocket, is pretty effective as a passer still in this point in his career. And I, th I think the Rams are a live dog in this one. So going to be exciting to see how it plays out here. Let's move on to an NFC North matchup between the Detroit Lions and the Chicago Bears. Going to go to Cody first on this one. Cody, how are you feeling about your Lions after that win over the Saints? And do you see any value in the numbers on this game? I mean, it blows my mind that we dropped 30 in a win 
and I feel somehow even worse. I, it's just, it, it's just, it's never ending. It's just the same old story. If we weren't absolutely gifted, and, and to be honest, it wasn't even Carr's fault. I didn't, hit, I think he hit the receiver in the hands or something, or he got tips, whatever. If we weren't gifted just an interception right away for glorious field position, it's, like, it's, we're talking potentially. We're talking probably a 10-point loss the other direction. Once the Saints got in the groove in the start of the second half, they just absolutely throttled the Lions. And that's including being without Carr for some of it, too. This defense just has absolutely horrendous issues. It blows my mind. And our rush defense is kind of taking a little step back, too. And then we lose Ali McNeil, which is a massive, massive loss in our front four across the middle. He is just an absolute big boy who you put in the middle and you're going to make a center's life miserable by collapsing him and someone else for just how massive he is. So now I, I don't know what we do. Rumors have it. We're talking to Sue now, but then now those rumors have turned into, well, now Sue's now looking at the Eagles. So, I mean, congrats Eagles. We every, Eagles can buy everyone. I, I, I don't know what we're going to do. And then we're potentially also without Anzalone who I have been very critical of him. I can't stand him. I will give him his flowers. He was one of the highest graded, if not the highest graded, pass coverage linebacker. Well, guess what? Now without him, we're going against Justin Fields, who you have to excel. You have to be elite at the linebacker position at being able to stay in coverage while spied while matching the quarterback size. I don't think we have anyone to even do that now. I, I don't know what we're going to do. I have This is a Justin Fields FU revenge game. After the ending to the last game, I he's especially with the weather, I, just, like they didn't even have to pass; they could run right over us, d dominate time of possession, and then take advantage of Goff, who throws absolute pumpkins in the heavy wind. He throws such a weak ball. Now we're expecting, I think, like seventeen to twenty mile per hour winds. There goes the mid range and the deep ball, which is the Lions' bread and butter. So it's going to revert to short throws against a very elite um, Bears front who's going to collapse this unhealthy Lions offensive line, who's going to stuff our run game, or maybe not stuff. Like They'll probably concede here and there because Montgomery and Gibbs are that good, but it's not going to be a consistent factor, especially if they get to stack the box. I have the Bears. I grab the Bears money line. I grab the Bears plus four. I grab the Bears plus three. But my biggest position is I'm putting them in a Wong teaser at Bears plus nine. This is a Bears revenge game written all over the stars here. Yeah, Cody, you covered a lot of it, but I'll hit a couple more points. Uh, yeah, the McNeil loss is massive. He's PFS six highest graded interior defensive lineman, and going against the Bears offensive line that sneaky, pretty good. Ninth and ninth and adjusted line yards, and they're going to be able to run the ball here. Six in, in rushing success rate. Um, the Lions, on the other hand, I think they're going to struggle to run the ball. Bears third in run defense EPA, and yeah, you talked about the injuries, like. You look at the Bears' injury report right now. They have one guy on it, Noah Sewell, who is dealing with a knee issue. And this was a questionable. Bears are one of the healthiest teams in the NFL now. And I think it's it's slept on how injured this team was earlier in the year. But Justin Fields has shown a lot to me in recent weeks. And the Vikings matchup was especially difficult for him because he was being blitzed heavily. And Luke Getz's, uh solution to that was to just make every single pass a screen pass and yeah, he was going to look bad in that situation, but I think the Lions pass defense is super vulnerable. So at home here with the Bears, you're getting Jared Goff on the road in weather conditions. Love the fade outdoor golf. Probably the last time this season we get to fade outdoor golf, but yeah, I'm all in with Cody. Love the Bears in the spot. I grabbed them plus five on the open, but would still play it at the current plus three. Schwartz, what do you think about this game? Wait, well, before you go, um, and if, also if I haven't made it clear, uh, this is what I'm pairing with the Ravens from what we talked about last one. So Ravens minus one, Bears plus nine. Just want to say, uh, Cole, after Cody's breakdown of that Lions Saints game, these spoiled freaking Lions fans complaining when you're nine and three about a game where your team scored thirty three points. Why don't you come back to the earth with us, Patriots fans? You don't understand. You'll never understand what we've gone through, what we go through with watching our team week in week out make everyone in New England upset. Um, wow, Cody wants to shoot me, but that's okay. Um, jokes aside, I. I'm kind of on the Bears here as well. Uh, although I, I have a slightly different um, outcome that I see here. It smacks of yet another game the Bears lose very, very closely uh, by like a point in a stupid way. But just on paper, I, I agree with basically everything Cody said. I think the Bears are going to be able to run the football while preventing the Lions from doing the same. If there's weather, that obviously exacerbates uh, the importance of both of those things. Uh, Cody really hit all of this. I mean, the O-line's been great since it got healthy. 
And honestly, I think if you're a Justin Fields hater, you're running out of complaints. I mean, he's not been top of the league. He's The fact that he was the leading MVP ticket taker over the offseason was a little bit crazy. But people who want to run him out of town for anybody other than uh, Caleb Williams, yeah, I think it's a little bit crazy. The dude's playing some really good football. Anytime Luke Getze gives him a chance, which is kind of rare because Getze's horrible at his job. But yeah, the, the Bears at home in this one, they're going to be very, very competitive. I don't know if they're going to win, but if they do... I'm going to be saying some pretty crazy things uh, about the Bears going forward. So I I have Bears plus three. I think it's a really good number in a really good spot on a team that is much better than its record shows. I it it's really it really stinks that this is that this took so long to happen because I do think that some of the offseason takes on the Bears while they were overzealous, it feels like they were a little less far off base than we might have thought after a month or two of the season because there's the Bears are showing positives on both sides of the football in in a lot of really constructive ways. Yeah, last thing I wanted to add in here. Um, you can really make the argument the Bears should have beaten the Lions a couple of weeks ago. They were up 12 points with four minutes left, and then Lions staged a, a pretty crazy comeback. And, you know, credit to them for making that happen. But the Bears, I think, were the better team that day. And we've, we've seen proof of, proof of concept that this Bears team can hang with the Lions. Now at home, outdoor Jared Goff, I think they have the chance to take this one outright. So love getting them plus three or better. Let's move on to the Houston Texans at the New York Jets. And oh. we, <laughs> we do have Zach Wilson back as the starter for the Jets this week. Announced this morning, spread for this game has been moved down. I think it opened closer to seven, maybe six and a half, uh, down to three and a half now. Total has also dropped dramatically, opened at 37, down to 33 points. Schwartz, you've been in on this Jets team at various points this season. Are you backing them here against this Texans team that I think we're all pretty big fans of? No, but I'm also not officializing anything at this time with the Texans on the road. The number I was looking at was five and a half. I'm leaning Texans uh, at, under that touchdown. But I think the Jets defense is such a moving target. They have the ability to do great stuff, but sometimes they just phone it in. And now Zach's back under center. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to make of that after the whole saga of him like kind of not wanting to do that. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that at the NFL level. This game is going to be a complete pass for me uh, from both the side and total uh, perspective because I just I don't know what to make of the Jets defense at this point in the season. Pretty short and concise here, but I, I do like this Texans team. I just am not a huge fan of betting them on the road if the Jets defense that it can be uh, shows up. That's always a tough proposition. Yeah, um, this is a pass for me ultimately, but I'm excited to see how CJ Stroud reacts to playing this defense. This is one of the tougher matchups he's played all season. Uh, on the road against the Jets in what looks to be pretty rough weather conditions as well. So going to be interested to see where his prop opens up. Might end up taking the under on his passing yards, which haven't done all season, but I think this is a good spot to fade him against a really difficult defense. And of course, Tank Dell out for the year. Um, really sad news on that one. And I mean, Cody, if you want to talk about that at all, give him a eulogy or anything like that, but any thoughts on this game overall? extremely rarely a non-Lions related news like breaks my heart like breaks my heart if you follow me on Twitter you know I've been dieting kind of getting a little healthy here um over the past five days <laughs> and um it took three days I broke I as soon as I saw I got the text about the Tank Dell thing grabbed a cigarette walked took a lap outside I I was severely heartbroken he's one of my favorite players like literally ever like in college I was so excited to see how he was blossoming with CJ Stroud. And the worst part is, is this game screamed Tank Dell. Jets, heavy dose of cover two. Uh, we've talked about it multiple times. The way you beat them, you throw underneath, you kind of get a Tyree Kill type of player, and you just let them run wild in the open field. That was Tank Dell. And we just got robbed of it. Was it enough to keep me away? Um, to be honest, I didn't really have too much interest at the first place for how line this, how high the line originally was. But now it's kind of creeping down to where I kind of want to bet the Texans here. Even with Zach Wilson, I mean, he's mentally checked out. Like, we know this. He literally outright said, like, I don't want to even come back as a starting quarterback. I, so, like, where, where, where's he at now with leading this offense? And this Jets defense, while still have absolute dudes, like, great team, they're getting tired. They're, they're regressing. We've talked about this. When you're on the field constantly, you can have the best defense in the world, but at some point you're going to get tired, sluggish, and teams are going to run on you. And now it's happening at an early rate for how horrible this jet stretch was. Now is it enough for Nico Collins and everyone else to kind of exploit? Uh, it's really, really tough because they're losing Dell. That's a huge dynamic uh, streaking across the middle. 
I might wait to see if this touches three. I highly doubt we'll get to three. If it does touch three, I am hitting the Texans. But um, as of right now, I'm just kind of going to monitor it and keep uh, weeping about my loss of Tank Dell. Yeah, uh, a lot of fantasy managers certainly right there with you in that Tank Dell depression. Um, was very excited to see how he was blossoming this season, and hopefully he gets to back to full health and continues to build on this connection with CJ Stroud because the future is bright in Houston. Let's move on to the other NFC South matchup that we have this week. Carolina Panthers traveling to face the New Orleans Saints. Panthers will be five and a half point underdogs. The spread has bounced around a little bit. I think it got as low as four and then came back up. But this game will be played indoors in the Superdome in New Orleans. So no weather concerns for this one, but still a fairly low total of 37 and a half points. Schwartz, I'll go to you first on this one. Any thoughts on the spread or the total here? I'm borderline leaning the Panthers plus five because I think so little of the Saints. But I really I really do think the Panthers can clamp down on the Saints pass catchers given their healthier their increased health in their secondary, especially and Chin did not like play at all, but JC Horn played on a pitch count, but not like a crazy low pitch count. And his PFF grade was over 90, which should sur- surprise literally nobody who's ever watched JC Horn. Dude's good. Uh, but I don't know. I, I just don't feel like I'm comfortable betting the Panthers in the Superdome. It, and maybe you want to be out of your comfort zone. I would like a little bit more of a rounder football number if I'm going to be investing them in this way. Panthers is my lean, but I'm not officializing anything out of this game. Cody, any thoughts on this one? Uh, I mean, I wanted. To, I, I've, I was kind of hoping this was going to be around three, and I was going to hit the Saints here. But I just I hate this five and a half. Can't even get in a long teaser either. I think, that, but then, but then, so I'm like, I, okay, so when you look at luck ratings, like the shame, the Saints actually did kind of get shafted, um, bad result, but so did the Panthers. So it's not like we're even getting like a buy low on either team. Are we? Are, are, no, we're technically getting buy low on both teams. Um, but this is this just, just climbed way too high for my liking, and now we're dealing with Jameis Winston throwing against who a, a secondary, a well, a very great, well coached. Um, defense especially secondary that we really like that i think could give james winston a lot of trouble but now it's like well shoot how are they gonna kind of shift this offense now are we gonna see like some more Taysom hill packages are they kind of gonna uh negate winston here and maybe just run it with camara who can find some success here i have no idea there's just way too many variables for me to kind of uh piece together a puzzle here to build a case on either side with this number kind of inflated, I'd probably play the Panthers at a plus six if it touches six, but it just sucks. Um, I was really going in hoping for a Saints minus three, open three and a half, waited. Now it's five and a half. It's like, oh, shoot. Now start looking at the other side here. But yeah, not, not nothing for this one. Uh, nothing on the total either. Yeah, lean to the Panthers for me as well. The, they might make it into my money line round robin as an underdog because – there's a lot of variance in this game with uh, Jameis Winston and his turnover variance, but Bryce Young also had three turnover-worthy plays last week and completed 48% of his passes, really didn't look all that much better uh, under new management with this offense. And I, I kind of just think at this point, it's going to need to be next season where we really see more from Bryce Young. Not going to happen on the road against this Saints defense, uh, which is starting to get a little bit healthier. Love to see J.C. Horn back out there and kind of a funny uh, back and forth with Schwartz last week on Horn about how effective he'd be right back in the lineup and PFF grade over 90 for the game. So he's one of the best corners in the NFL. So happy to see him back out there. But yeah, overall, this is a tough game for me. Uh, if you can get the Panthers at six or better, I like it a lot, but it, it's a pass for me at the current number. Um, let's move on to the Jaguars at the Browns and Jaguars were playing their first Monday night football game since 2011 and the vibes were good. They were 10 point favorites. Everything seemed to be in place and, it's hard to imagine that game going any more disastrously. Trevor Lawrence, significant ankle injury. Christian Kirk out for the year with a growing injury. Jaguars lose the game as 10-point home favorites. Now they got to pick up the pieces and go on the road to face Cleveland, where they will be three-point underdogs, shifting to three-and-a-half in a couple of spots as I'm looking at it right now. Cody, are we backing C.J. Beathard on the road against this Browns defense? Christian, that's official on Christian Kirk. I didn't hear that. I believe so. I'll, I'll check right now while you, wow. you talk. Yeah. That's a huge, huge loss. Um, no, uh, obviously, I got nothing on this. Um, if you're a follower of ours, you know I absolutely hate backing quarterback uncertainty. And, well, this game has it with um, C.J. Bethard. I I don't know. He, 
it was a he, the issue is we didn't see too much because he did impress me with a downfield shot to Ridley um, that eventually that got called back. So it's nice to know that he'll stretch out the ball because you have to against this Browns defense. Now this Browns defense also regressing like how we were talking about with um oh shoot oh with the Jets. There, it's just a unit that's constantly on the field and their numbers are starting to dip because of it because they're just getting tired. But now do the Jags have enough offensive firepower to kind of take advantage of that? I have no idea because the Travis Etienne thing, it's not working uh, for the ground game. This ground game is just practically non-existent and it's, it's horrendous for the unit as a whole. And now, and now you have a backup quarterback without a um, reliable receiver. So you're kind of just limited to here now with Ridley and Ingram. It's... I, I I can't build a case that the Browns can pull away, and I can't build a case that the Jags can keep it tight enough at this current number. Um, too much uncertainty for me. I, I'm just I'm not going to bet it. Yeah, uh, I just checked. Christian Kirk out for officially six to eight weeks, so theoretically could return if they make a deep playoff run, but we'll, we won't see him again this, this regular season. It sounds like. Um, speaking of injuries, Miles Garrett clearly not 100 percent healthy right now uh, in the game against the uh, against the Rams last week. No tackles, no sacks, just two total pressures on 56 snaps. So clearly just not right right now. And when he's not right, this Browns defense isn't right. They will get Denzel Ward back this week, but I really don't hate the Jaguars as a teaser piece. Um, don't hate the Jaguars plus three and a half, but probably a pass for me. Schwartz, anything you're seeing with this game? Honestly, I, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, I, I fans of the show may know I've, know I've moved to Cleveland recently. I'm thinking I might be able to invest about a unit and get a half and get a ticket at, on the 50 at field level. So that could be a interesting way to approach this one, literally. But I'm not going to approach it from a betting standpoint. Cody said it: quarterback uncertainty. There's injury uncertainty beyond that part of the lineup. It's not worth touching. Although 30 and a half is a point total that I've seen it. That's just begging to be put over. It, it, the Browns have given up 65 points over their past two games. It's a, still a good defense, but it's not, uh, you know, an impenetrable wall or anything. The only issue for me here, it's not even the backup quarterbacks. It's really the weather. It could be really icky out here, and that is possibly why the ticket prices are where they are and what will eventually stop me from going to this game. Uh, but it, it's just not worth betting. It, it's an interesting one. I'm leaning over 30. I'm definitely not. I don't even have a lean in terms of the spread, I'm not, I have no interest in playing that angle. Well, for all the games you've gone to this year and your quest for watching every ugly game possible, you have to go to this game. I have Browns. Yeah, yeah, have I mean, Tom Robinson against an elite defense against CJ against an elite. De- like this is this is prime will game. I, I have Browns choice. Bears coming up. I feel like I've I've done my duty, or I'm about to do my duty for Cleveland. I'll have one in Cleveland. I'll no, have one Bears in are, Soldier. I'll have one the Bears in Bears category now. We do not put the Bears in this state of Jags in the same breath. They're still the Bears. It's the Bears in Jan- in December in a must win game. I'm expecting some kind of comedy. All love and respect for the Browns fans who will undoubtedly be at this game in 20 mile an hour. Great fan base out here. Toward. Absolutely DJ great fan base and out here. Love them. Yeah, much respect to the fans because I would not be going to this game under any circumstances, but no. it will be played. Um, yeah, 30-point total, one of the lowest we've seen in recent history. Um, right up there with the Patriots and Steelers on Thursday Night Football. So, oh, yeah, so to see how that one plays out, but let's move on to the Seahawks at the 49ers. NFC West rematch. We saw the 49ers dismantle the Seahawks on Thanksgiving. Heading into this one, they're 10.5-point favorites an over under a 46 and a half Schwartz how are you feeling about this rematch here any angle you like from a betting standpoint absolutely not and that's what makes it a game that I'm super excited to watch because I really am pretty pretty iffy on what's actually going to happen and that's kind of what makes sports fun at times but I'm not fading the Niners again let alone at home in a game where I like them on paper but this is way too big of a number for like a divisional rivalry game even with the Seahawks in worst form I know we try and keep our analysis hard here but we're talking, once again, Pete Carroll versus the Niners with Kyle Shanahan. We've seen this a million times. These teams are super intense with each other. It's super competitive. Uh, that being said, it's not enough to make me back the Seahawks because, like I said, the Niners are the play on paper, even at 10 and a half. I, I don't think the Hawks can take advantage of the relative shakiness in the Niners' run defense. I'm just not comfortable uh, with the number for San Francisco in a game where we know this is this is the Seahawks' Super Bowl. They have two Super Bowls. Uh, in a year where they're not contending for actual Super Bowls, and this is one of them, it's just not an appropriate place to be playing a double-digit spread on a home favorite. I'm excited to see it, but uh, for those reasons, I'm out. 
Yeah, I will say, if you want to back the Seahawks here, my preferred way to do it would be with the first quarter spread. You can get, you can get that at plus three and a half in some, some spaces. Um, it is juiced at minus 120, but I think the Seahawks start here pretty fast. I think they're going to come out. They have the rest advantage after playing on Thursday last week. And like Schwartz said, this is their biggest game of the season. So I wouldn't be shocked if the Seahawks are leading after the first quarter. We see the Niners start a little slow off that big win over the Eagles. But over the course of the game, the Niners should uh, pull away. Cody, any thoughts on the spread of the total here? Oh, I can't. I'm struggling to build a case for the Seahawks. But man, I hate this number for the 49ers. They, but they, but at the same time, they have, they have had no issue putting away um, some opponents like this. You, we uh, Kenneth Walker. I'm assuming he's coming back. It's still, he's listed as questionable. Um, is it? Is it? It's to me. It's just can they do enough to stack the 49ers box? Kind of have to make them respect their own struggles in defending the run. And also, I mean, but also at the same time, DK Metcalf has kind of been building out a role with Geno Smith here. He's, he's been doing an absolutely phenomenal job, and he's just really imposing his will as the most freak athlete at his position. But, man, this 49ers team is just so elite in coverage. So, so elite. Third across the board – or, no, third in pass defense DVOA, six success rate. You're going to really make Geno under pressure convert at farther distances. I don't know if he can do it at a high enough rate to sustain drives on the field. And now once you're giving the 49ers the ball, this 49ers offense is clicking on all cylinders. Now they're kind of back at full health. I don't know how the Seahawks really stop them. When Debo, Ayuk, and McCaffrey find open space, we're talking chunks at a time and quick scores. You can say that this is a letdown spot, though, after the huge win last week. I just don't even know if that matters in this one. It's a stay away for me. I I think what I'm going to do is, well, I'm also looking at the over, though, because I do agree that the Seahawks could punch him in the mouth early. And, and if they can even do slightly towards their part, I have no uh, oh, actually, no, hold on. I might do a 49ers team total over. Let me look at the number. I know what you like. You, you want to just go ahead. Yeah, I, I do like the over here. And I looked at the Niners team total over. It's at 28 and a half, which is kind of a rough number. I, I, they're going to they're gonna get to 30 in this game. I'm pretty confident. They've been over that team total in seven of eight games where Trent Williams is healthy this season, which we talked about it last week. We got a YouTube comment, somebody saying that Trent isn't a big deal. Well, I think Trent Williams was a pretty damn big deal in that game against the Eagles, but Brock Purdy leads the NFL and adjusts the EPA per play. This offense is number one in the league by DVOA, EPA, success rate, just across the board. And Seahawks defense has just completely fallen off a cliff, especially against the run. 32nd in run defense EPA since week eight. But the big thing for the Seahawks here is their offensive line is now healthy. They got Abe Lucas back at right tackle last week, which is enormous for their blocking against arguably the best pass rush in the NFL right now. Gino was under pressure against the Cowboys last week, but they had a really good game plan for how to handle that. And I think they're going to have more of the same here. Gino had six big time throws in that game. And if he plays like that, they're going to be able to put up points on the road here. Niners should have no issues putting up points as well. So really like the over in this one. I think, I think it's something like 30 to 20 Niners would, would be a pretty safe bet here. But Cody, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I'm going to be leaning towards that over as well. I, or um, I'm sorry, I think I'm going to be leaning towards that uh, 49ers team total over as well. I do like the idea of the Seahawks doing their part of like what you just said, but I just think that the more consistent thing will be the Niners scoring here, and and I, and I think that's the way I'm going to go about this one. Um, and yeah, that that Trent Williams comment was that, that that's just so hilarious. Um, we try not to put too much stock into YouTube comments, but you got to realize how massive of a role Trent Williams is to this offense. He literally is like the focal point of their offense. You got <laughs> the way that they shift him and move him, how he can anchor one side. I I could just watch Trent Williams tape like all day long if I want to. And I honestly, that kind of sounds nice with some dinner after this. Yeah. The other thing I want to say about the Seahawks is the emergence of Jackson Smith and Jiba is, the, is huge for their offense because now you have three wide receivers that you really have to pay attention to with him, DK Metcalf, and Tyler Lockett. And the Niners secondary is improving, but they still have some holes that I think the Seahawks can exploit to an extent. Um, and I wouldn't be shocked if their defense is a little bit flat early on, given the huge win they're coming off of. So wouldn't, wouldn't be shocked if the Seahawks get 10 plus points in the first half and really help contribute to the over here. But Schwartz, any lean on the total for you? Again, on paper, I, I really do like a lot of what you guys are putting out there. It's again, I'm just really, really not comfortable 
uh, contradicting the my, my original take about how weird these rivalry games get. It's just not numbers I'm super comfortable with, although I do want to get involved talking about the Trent Williams thing. Uh, I'm just clicking through PFF and <laughs> trying to find the last time a team won a Super Bowl without really good run blocking. And shocker, the only team of the last about about 10 years to win a Super Bowl with sub- average run blocking in the postseason was Tom Brady and the Buccaneer or sorry, pass blocking Tom Brady and the Bucks. So if you're not Tom Brady, you're not winning without stellar offensive line play, not just good. So I think it's hard to overvalue a player who's impactful as Trent in both the pass game and the run game. When you're someone like the 49ers who have, they run on rushing offense and Brock really needs a clean pocket. He really, really does. So uh, I think him being healthy is huge for this team, which is why I'm not willing, a huge part of why I'm not willing to fade them out. Right. Big Trent Williams show here. All right, let's move on to the Las Vegas Raiders hosting the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings went on a really fun run um, prior to that loss to the Bears in that Monday Night Football game. All came crashing down for them. Josh Dobbs finally looked like, I think, what we were expecting for most of the year, and he was defying all of our expectations, but came crashing down for him. Going to be excited to see if he can improve coming off the bye week with more time to get familiar with his teammates and learn the playbook and all that. And Schwartz, curious how you're feeling about Josh Dobbs. Justin Jefferson, back for the Vikings this week. Huge deal for their offense. Do you think they bounce back off that loss with a win here on the road? Absolutely. I think it's almost impossible to underrate the Raiders because they're, I think they're like a 5-7 and seven team with the profile of a 2-10 and 10 team. They should not be in this game at all. I don't I don't know how it's only minus three, even though it's in Vegas. I understand that the Vikings look bad. Josh Dobbs look bad. The Bears played a good game, and the Bears are now kind of a good team. I, I Whatever. We'll talk about the Bears. We talked about the Bears, and we will talk about it again. But that was a weird matchup, and, and Dobbs, he's not going to be the like borderline star-looking guy that he was at times. But no, he's not going to throw four picks every game. He, not everything that he did was a complete sham. And it's hard to overstate, just as we said, it's hard to overstate how valuable one guy can be when it's a Trent Williams. Uh, the ripple effect of Justin Jefferson coming back is tremendous because now you have Jordan Addison bumping down to being, instead of like a stretched number one, he's one of the best second options you're going to find. I, I really think highly of the rookie. Uh, so now the Vikings are going to have multiple guys that the Raiders need to contend with offensively. Um, in the air game, TJ Hawkinson's the team receiving leader. Uh, he's been phenomenal for them. I just don't see how the Raiders, whose defensive DVOA is 29th in the league, are going to be able to run with the Vikings. Uh, so, oh, excuse me, that was the Raiders' uh, offensive DVOA. Their defensive DVOA is 23rd in the league. Still not awesome. Don't see them running with the Vikings in that capacity. But on a similar vein, Vikings defense has been great, uh, including that Bears game. They held the Bears out of the end zone. Only team to not give up a touchdown and still... Uh, lose the game at that point. Now the Patriots are part of that, but uh, Raiders are DVOA on offense is 29th and the Vikings are top 10 by just about every metric. So I don't really see the Raiders moving it. I don't see them stopping the Vikings. Minus three is a smash play for me. I don't care that I'm not getting a hook. Not at all. Cody, I'm going to make a take that I want you to respond to and I'm curious your thoughts on it. But if Jefferson played the entire season and Kirk Cousins never gets hurt, I think the Vikings might be a better team than the Lions. I'm curious how you feel about that. Um, I don't know if I'd say better, but I would say pick them. Definitely, like at the at minimum, pick them. Um, it's just, it's just so tough because I, Kirk Cousins absolutely gutted. Um, because when you look at how great he was playing, like we were literally talking top five play, and it was top three play if it wasn't for now others kind of stepping up during that absence. The Justin Jefferson thing, I do agree, is going to be a huge presence out there, and it does change everything. Who I'm also high, I'm very high in Jordan Addison. He's going to be in a lot more comfortable role. Uh, Hawkins and targets open up. They would shred this Lions defense in general, but it, I just man, that's a tough. Dude, I'm one. just envisioning because this Vikings defense. This Vikings defense has made major improvements. I think they could slow down the Lions. I think I, I think I would side with the Vikings in that one, um, just for how they're looking now. I'm just envisioning Kirk Cousins still leads the NFL in adjusted completion rate, so most accurate passer. And I mean, you look at like Jefferson, Addison, Hawkinson, like <laughs> against this Lions the secondary. Is, the, is I think teams would catch on real quick, and um, 
I call it the Drake May method. Um, you just drop back in coverage, and you can just kind of really, really slow him down. Um, because that's the, the only issue I have with the Vikings here is I don't think Madison's punishing the Lions' rush defense out no. back when the rush defense was healthy and doing a great job. Because uh, Madison is just one of the worst running backs in football. Just, oh, I'm so... Um, I think it would be a super intriguing game at full health. Just sucks we we're kind of robbed of that. Yeah, um, but even but with, now even at the same the... time, now if Cousins gets to be healthy, our secondary gets to be healthy. We get CJ Gardner Johnson back, who was a stud, and I think that could change some things on our back end here. But I think as of right now, if you put them together, yeah, it would. If you had Kirk Cousins back and a healthy Jefferson, I would definitely mm-hmm. lean towards him because his defense has made major strides. They can slow down the Lions' offense, and I think they could squeak out a win. Even with CJ Gardner yeah, Johnson, I'm not sure here. about the. Um, I'm not sure about the depth of that secondary going up against Addison and Hawkinson as well. And it, while we're on this, if can we make uh, Tevin Jenkins, Braxton Jones, and Justin Fields healthy for the entire season as well and get a real NFC North race going in here? All you right, know what's uh, kind of funny? The NFC North at the start of the year was kind of like laughed at for being a joke. It's kind of turning into a pretty not competitive as in like who, not competitive as who can win it, but competitive as like these teams are kind of finding an identity and like they're playing good. Packers are playing great, Bears are playing good, Lions are winning games. The uh, the Vikings are now about to get a lot healthier and be competitive, even more competitive. But um, I'm just gonna go right into my cap uh, just because we've been talking a lot here. So I'm not gonna say I was I bought the Dobbs Kool Aid. Um, he got the benefit of kind of just not really giving defenses tape here of what, how he was going to kind of handle learning this offense. And I said before the Bears game, the issue with Dobbs was going to be when he faces a linebacking unit who can just negate his running and just make him sit in the pocket and kind of revert towards. He's a capable passer, but he's not like a lethal passer. And now, obviously, it's not going to say, like, oh, I called the four interceptions coming, but I called a poor passing performance coming. Little did I know it was going to get that rough. Um, so now you, you look ahead here and you're like, well, shoot, can the Raiders kind of do the same thing with their second level of the defense? Can they stop Dobbs and kind of his running? Can they stop him from kind of shifting the defense to his liking and opening up gaps even wider for Hawk, Addison, and JG to exploit? I don't think they can. Now, I will give the Raiders their flowers. I have been very, very mean to them, um, especially on the defensive end. This used to be one of the worst units in football. Their pass defense, their coverage has taken major strides. We're talking once like, 28th i think off top of my head and like past defense dvoa all the way up to 18th and they're, they're just making more steady improvements the issue is is they don't have the linebackers i think to kind of just sit and anchor dob successfully while he's kind of doing his thing and moving him around and now you got jj who's going to command attention i think the most consistent thing you can back here is the vikings offense putting up points and i will gladly take their team total of over 20 and a half it is slightly a little juice I'll drink the juice. I don't care. I, I just I don't want to get hooked by a 21 and a half. So, yeah, Vikings over 20 and a half. And then their defense, like I said, this Vikings defense, has, it's a very, very formidable unit, which just sounds crazy to say after how awful they were last year. Um, and they're getting Aiden O'Connell. Uh, I think they can take advan- advantage of them, um, really stall out the Raiders' offense. And it's just extra possessions going towards the Vikings for more scoring opportunities to clear this mark. Yeah, I think the Vikings are one of the defenses that you really don't want to face if you're a rookie quarterback with all the disguised pressures and everything Brian Flores does for them. Um, not thrilled about Aiden O'Connell facing that defense, although I do think uh, the Raiders' pass defense has improved a lot. Uh, eighth in dropback EPA allowed since week eight. So, been a lot better, like Cody said, and they do a really good job of limiting big plays. Um, it's a pass for me from a side perspective. Really lean the under and might end up firing on it. I'm going to do a little more reading on it because – I kind of just thought of that just now. But, yeah, lean the under for me. Um, Schwartz, you're on the Vikings there. Let's move on to divisional matchup between the Denver Broncos and the Los Angeles Chargers. Schwartz, you were on the Broncos last week. Very close game throughout and really had a chance to cover on the final play of the game. Uh, Failed in that fourth down conversion. But any thoughts on the Broncos heading into this matchup against the Chargers? Oh, we're so back, dude. We're uh, we're going to bet on the Broncos once again. Back to the well. Back in the Broncos. Got that flat three I was looking for. I, I was seeing two and a half earlier. I don't get how anyone can be, almost anyone, I should say, can be an underdog with this Chargers team. They They tried to lose to the 2023 New England Patriots. That's so hard. It's so hard. This is a great buy low after a road loss to a good team for Denver, while the Chargers are still horrible. 
I don't think the 27th pass defense DVOA in the league is going to do it against Mr. Unlimited and uh, the current form of Cortland Sutton, who just makes at least two or three ridiculous downfield plays every single game, it feels like. Uh, well, I'm sure Wayne's about to get into this, so I'm not going to get too uh, heavy into it, but Justin Herbert's looked off. And the current version of the Broncos defense, uh, anchored by my dude Justin Simmons, uh, is going to be able to limit him. So I think that Broncos plus three is a smash. I am considering, uh, I mean, I already got in. I'm not officializing it uh, for you guys, but I'm already lightly in on the Broncos money line, and I'm considering doubling down. Uh, This is a really good spot for Denver. I think the Chargers are completely bottoming out. Fire Brandon Staley. Yeah, um, I I hate I hate to say it, but I, I am on the Broncos here, and it's ultimately it's just a coaching bet for me. It's Sean Payton versus Brandon Staley in a game where there is no home field advantage. Uh, I actually I might go to this game to be honest. I'm I'm pretty close to LA, and I might bring my Broncos jersey up there. But um, yeah, I just this is just a bad matchup for the Chargers. They can't run the ball at all. Dead last in rushing success rate, and that's where you really want to attack the Broncos because their secondary really has improved a lot. Uh, they're 31st in run defense DVOA, but their secondary has been getting better. Uh, the Chargers' entire offense right now is kind of just throwing it to Keenan Allen, and that's not going to work with Patrick Sertain blanketing him. Chargers receivers have had a really rough year, especially with the injuries, and they've lost the most EPA to drops in the NFL. I, that's just that's not going to change with Quentin Johnson running out there. Um, and the Broncos might be the worst team in this matchup. I think you can make that argument, but I think that's overcome by... Sean Payton just being a far better coach than Brandon Saley. I mean, the Broncos are minus three in turnover differential last week, 0 for 11 on third down, got out game by over 50 yards, and they still had a chance to beat a very good Texans team on the road. And to me, that's just coaching. I think Sean Payton gives them a chance to win every week, and I think this is a good spot to back them. Uh, Cody, any thoughts here? Yeah, I'm all over the Broncos as well. Um, I, I call it the Drake May uh, method earlier. Um, cause I said that last year when that's how, when Drake may start looking bad, they just drop back in coverage. I should really call him for the NFL. It's a Justin Herbert method. Now <laughs> it's chargers run game. Austin Eckler. Wh- what happened? You used to be one of the, if not the best, at least with McCaffrey, you're a dual threat sensation. You just haven't looked the same since he came back. He has not given this ground game any life, any 25th rush defense DVOA 32nd in success rate. That means the Chargers are the worst team at even getting like four yards to gain, five yards a game on first down, second cutting second down, converting third down. You're forcing Herbert to throw into the now there's just these coverage heavy units. I mean, I think the absolute lowest of the Patriots, this is not a shot at will, but you know, especially uh, with their coverage, the, even the Patriots can prove just sell out to stop the pass and you're going to hold the Chargers to six. In the worst game I've ever seen, to six, and 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 well, as we mentioned, this coverage without Christian Gonzalez, like this Patriots coverage, like is nothing special. It's horrible in metrics, and they just slowed down the Chargers' one-dimensional offense. Now you're letting the Broncos do the same thing with a far better uh, coverage unit. Man, uh, good luck moving the ball with that one. And then I think the Broncos. Um, we did talk about the turnover luck. Little did we know it was going to be Russell Wilson. I think what three interceptions. Now he's taking on just a horrific defense. I, I hand up earlier this year. I tried to make so many excuses that this this, this unit would turn it around just because of the talent they have. I don't understand how they could have great talent in all three positions. Oh, now also without Bosa, um, and just play the way they're playing. These numbers are just absolutely horrendous. Twenty seventh pass defense DVOA, twenty second rush. The the Broncos offense, don't get me wrong, they're not like world beaters by by any means, but I think Javante Williams is in a great position to um kind of set up Russell Wilson and their pass attack here. And you're giving me a key number of three, even on the road with not even a home field advantage. I wouldn't be surprised if there's more Bronco fans out there. Um, yeah, I'm all over the Broncos here. And I think even the market's agreeing. I think it's dipped to two and a half. Yeah, two and a half is now starting to show up wildly. Yeah, if this is at two and a half when you're watching it, I think the Broncos become maybe the best teaser Teaser. piece on the board. Um, Tease it up to eight and a half. That's the way I would approach it if it's at that number when you're watching it. But yeah, I think we all agree. I think the Broncos have a very good chance of winning this game outright. And on the Eckler point, I think Justin Herbert just doesn't even seem to want to throw him the ball anymore because he knows when he gets the ball in his hands, it's just not 
nothing's really going to happen. So uh, hate to see it for Eckler was one of the better running backs in the league, like Cody said, and it just, it just hasn't happened for him this year coming off the injury. So Schwartz, any final thoughts before we move on to our last game? Yeah, I mean, I it's not I I would disagree that I don't know how this defense isn't performing better. It's because they have the single worst head coach in the entire NFL who's supposed to be a defensive guy and has completely failed at his job. But yeah, I mean, obviously we're all together on that, which is a little bit eerie, but I like it. I think this is a great spot for Denver. They they need this absolutely need this win uh to stay in the playoff hunt in a very crowded AFC. So and I think the, and I think they'll get it. This is exactly the kind of spot where Sean Payton's gonna shine. All right, let's move on to the final game on the board. The game of the week, in my opinion. Buffalo Bills at the Kansas City Chiefs, competing with the Cowboys and Eagles for the game of the week, but should be an awesome one. Always fun to watch Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes square off. Looking at a spread of down to minus one and a half for the Chiefs, over or under a 48 and a half points. I have a lot of thoughts in this game. I'm assuming Cody has a lot of thoughts in this game, but Schwartz, I'm going to let you go first on this one. How are you feeling about the Chiefs coming off that loss to the Packers on Sunday Night Football? Dude, I'm so ready to get burned. I'm buying low on the Chiefs. They've looked rough recently, but if there's anything we've learned from these Chiefs is that that's the exception and not the rule. They're going to bounce back eventually. I think it's going to happen right now. We're talking about the Mahomes under a field goal thing. I don't love trends, but some things aren't trends. It's just that really good quarterbacks win home games. And when they're given a small spread, usually a win is going to be a cover as well. So I think that Mahomes under a field goal at our head angle is great here. Call it an angle. It hits all the same. I think the Matt Milano injury is still a serious issue. We talk about, uh, we've talked a lot in this show about how uh, good middle linebacking crews are really important when you're going up against mobile quarterbacks. Now, Patrick Mahomes is not a mobile quarterback in the sense that he's going to pop off for 95 rushing yards on 12 carries. What Mahomes does do better than maybe anyone ever has in this game of football is use his level of athleticism behind the line of scrimmage to open up passes and create opportunities and even scramble. To con- He's made a huge scramble conversion in like almost every big Chiefs when it feels like. Milano uh, was a ki- is the kind of guy who can limit that. He can cover while spying and force ever he can allow the Bills defense to stay home while Mahomes is doing his behind the line of scrimmage stuff. He's out. That's a huge problem. And I think conversely, the Chiefs have the dudes in the front seven to limit Josh Allen's physical gifts. He's great against the blitz, but bad against the pressure. This is interesting. The Chiefs blitz a lot, but they do get home. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But I, I think that there will be some big plays available for Allen for that reason. But I, I think there's going to be classic Josh Allen turnovers at some point in this one, just with the with the level at which the Chiefs are able to get home, uh, even against mobile quarterbacks. I think this is a fascinating game. It's been one of the AFC defining matchups over the past few years, but this could be a dagger for the Bills if they don't pull the upset out. Yeah, yeah. Bill's season's on the line in this game. If they lose, they're done. Um, but I think they're going to win. And Schwartz, a few points I want to bring up that you mentioned. First of all, the Matt Milano injury has been a big issue, but it gave an opportunity to Tyrell Dodson to get on the field, who has been PFS' second highest graded linebacker this season. He's been excellent. And I think that's going to continue here. The Bills are in a great spot here. The Chiefs had a road Sunday night football game up in Lambeau, traveling back home from it. The Bills, meanwhile, have a huge rest edge off their bye week from last week. The Bills have been the most unlucky team in the NFL this season, minus 2.6 rating according to team rankings. And I love backing them uh, in this spot for a few reasons. First of all, you talked about the Chiefs pass rush. The Bills are going to put pressure on Patrick Mahomes here. Their third and pass rush win rate. The Chiefs tackles, to me, have been a very big weakness, especially when they are getting flagged for their false starts, which wasn't happening at the beginning of the year, as Cody can test to from all the way back in that Lions-Chiefs game. Um, but Josh Allen has just been better than Patrick Mahomes this season by virtually every metric. Better in PFF passing grade, better in yards per attempt, even better in turnover-worthy play rate. Allen's actually has, Allen actually has the sixth lowest turnover-worthy play rate. We love to talk about Josh Allen's interceptions. He's been unlucky in that regard to have so many turnover-worthy, so few turnover-worthy plays, but higher amount of interceptions. Big issue for me here. The Chiefs just don't have the skill players right now to really compete. Travis Kelsey is clearly declining at 34 years old. No, I'm not going to say it's because of Taylor Swift, but he is having one of his worst seasons. He just looks a step slower, and his yards per route run, yards per reception have declined. And I think the Chiefs just don't have enough answers for this Bills defense. And the Bills defense has had some issues this season, but they're getting healthier. Coming off the bye week, I think they're going to be able to have some success, but... 
Bill's offense is the best unit on the field in this game, in my opinion. Third in DVOA, fourth in EPA. Josh Allen is going to win this game for them coming off the bye week. Very excited to see what Joe Brady cooks up, the new offense coordinator for them, but love the Bills in this spot. Cody, how are you feeling about this game? Well, you know I love the Mahomes angle, uh, anything under three. So what's the best way to bypass that? Wong teaser, baby. Wong you know teaser. Coming. <laughs> yep. I love me some Wong teasers. Um, I'm going to be combining – oh, well, I guess I have to say it. I got the Bills up to two and a half. I'm going to be combining them with the Packers. I'm just saying that now because Packers are a separate video. We'll be talking about it later, which I just realized I have to do a different angle for them now. But So, yeah, um, that's kind of helping with my Packers case. I love the uh, the Bills' Wong teaser here, and it's it's simple. I don't see how the Chiefs get them off the field. This Bills team, we're talking top five Russian pass EPA. And it's, the, this Chiefs defense, man, like great coverage unit, but man, they can't stop the run. And I think you can use the run here to kind of set up these Josh Allen um, deep balls, and it, which is going to come to hopefully great reward because now it's hopefully it's at less coverage to kind of negate some of these backbreaking Allen turnovers that we have oh so come to love. And then on the other end, I think this Bills, um, since they, they kind of had that stumble with injuries, they have been steadily improving. I think they can get to this. I don't want to call it a weak Chiefs offense, but I'm just running out of adjectives here. Discombobulated? Ooh, we're using that. Um, Kelsey, he's looking slower. He's looking kind of sluggish. Um, I truly think, and they just won't say it, I truly think him and Mahomes are dealing with injuries that they just refuse to say out loud. That um, Was it the Broncos game? where Kelsey had that non-contact knee freak thing um, that we thought like his season was over. Uh, Mahomes, every time he gets like kind of weirdly tackled, he's always limping on that same ankle he had issues with last year. I truly think there's something going on. And then that's not even factoring in that this pass catching group that is just has not stepped up when they've needed to. I don't think the Chiefs can honestly match the Bills scoring pace in this one. It's just a really bad spot for the Chiefs. I I, I got the Bills. Now I do, I I will admit, I shouldn't be terrified of narratives, but I am terrified of the late Magic uh, Chiefs action here uh, to potentially cover that thing. So that's why I will gladly take the Bills in a Wong teaser, but it would not also surprise me if the Bills just run away in this one. Yeah, and part of the uh, luck that I wanted to I wanted to just shout out this stat is the Bills have the fifth highest point differential in the NFL at plus 101, and they're still 6-6 six and six somehow. The Chiefs, meanwhile, eight and four, but they're below the Bills in point differential. Um, basically, saying the Bills have lost a lot of re- really close games. They're due for some positive regression, and I think they get that this week. Um, the other point I want to make: Schwartz has talked about the Chiefs' pass rush. Bills' offensive line has been elite. First in adjusted sack rate allowed, fourth in line yards. Quietly one of the better units in the NFL this season. They're going to hold up here, in my opinion. I think James Cook could have a big game. Really excited to see more out of Dalton Kincaid and Cleo Shakir as really big parts of this offense, but I just think the Bills have more answers on offense at the skill position uh, spots. And I think Josh Allen, with the season on the line, goes into Arrowhead and gets the win. Schwartz, you want to um, rebuttal anything that I said? I actually think it's really interesting if the Bills pull this one out, they're a game behind the Chiefs with <laughs> not that they're going to win the division and make that matter for seeding, but I just think it's very interesting how differently these teams are perceived and they could be one game away from being just right there. Uh, yeah, I think on paper, a lot of the things you guys said make a lot of sense. I'm too, I'm definitely concerned about Kelsey. Mahomes might be hurt right now, but Kelsey might be trending towards done. I mean, he's a six foot five dude who's like 34 years old uh, and comes for everybody. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that he's done, done, but he might be done being the most dominant receiving threat in the league uh, for some time. Uh, or forever he'd be done forever so I that gives me a little bit of pause I just I am not sure that the Bills offense is going to be able to do this like kind of score every possession thing we're talking about against the Chiefs defense but you guys make some compelling points I think that there's just something about these legendary quarterback head coach like dynasty juggernaut type of situations where they just find a way every single time especially at home I hated when people would just kind of always say this is it and this is the spot where the Patriots stumble and it never would be. I've tried not to be that guy for the Chiefs dynasty, but yeah, on paper, th- this could be this is, could be a spot where they're vulnerable. I just think we've seen this film a handful of times and I'm going to stay on the Chiefs side as long as the number's with me, which it was. I was able to grab that two and a half. I'll give you a pop. Thing I want to bring up here. Kelsey, that is a hot take. Oh, what was that? What was it? I uh, couldn't hear you there. 
uh, I'll give you props. That is a hot take on the Dunn, Kelsey Dunn thing. Not like not like he's about to retire tomorrow, but he's he's six foot five, thirty four years old, and accumulating lower body injuries. It's just he's not going to play. Let, let's talk about like if he is perfectly healthy, his horizon is like four more years at most. I mean, we're not talking about we're talking about quarterbacks making it to forty, not six. I guess I just didn't realize how old he was. Yeah, he was. Um, he was born in nineteen eighty nine. He's he just he just turned thirty four. Thirty four. Yeah. yeah, and it, so at best he had three or four years left, and when you start accumulating those injuries, you're a big dude putting a lot of stress on your lower body. How how much more mileage can you have left after you start getting banged up? It's not a knock on him. He's had an amazing career. I think he's the third best tight end of all time and a first ballot Hall of Famer, but. You know, two rings, handful of all pro nods, almost a hundred touchdowns. I think time comes for everyone, and there's no shame if that's what this is for Travis after this season. The other point I want to make is, if you agree with me that the Bills can go on the road and win this game in the Arrowhead, you should be buying Bills futures in the Super Bowl market. You can still get them at forty-five to one on DraftKings, which is an insane number. Um, yes, their playoff chances are, are looking a little bit grim. And they would have to be, they'd probably have to be damn near close to perfect the rest of the way. But after this, they do get the Cowboys at home in a game where I think they'll be favored. And then the final week, they'll play the Dolphins in Miami. Not a spot where they've done well historically, but if they win that game, they're in the playoffs probably. And the last thing the number two seed wants to see in the first round is going to be the Chiefs as a seven seed. I think they find a way to get there. And once they're in the playoffs, they're a very live dog. So. I love the Bills at 45 to 1 to win the Super Bowl because this team, if they get in the playoffs, they're, they have the, the caliber of a Super Bowl team. They're sixth in DVOA, fifth in net EPA. This is one of the better teams in the NFL that's continually gotten unlucky. But if they go on a run to close the season out here, I think they're very live in the Super Bowl race. Uh, Cody, any thoughts on that aspect of it? My only pushback on that is I'm probably going to wait because um, you said, what, they got Cowboys next? I just, I don't see it dipping too far down. Um, it just I guess it also depends if everything else plays out with who's like around them too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could sell me on buying them now. They're definitely someone I have been looking at for that exact same reason. I just I kind of I I want to I I'm toying with just being greedy and just waiting until maybe Cowboys or in that, or to see what the overreaction is to them beating the Chiefs because if they squeak out a win, we're talking about we dip down to forty five, we dip down to forty. Um, because at the same time, I'm a lot higher on the Cowboys. The Cowboys could shut that down <laughs> and ruin that dream. But, um, yeah, I do. I really, really like the angle. I think I just might get greedy and wait one more week. Wayne, what do you I think, think about um, What do you think about the Bills? They're sitting somewhere around 4-1 to one just to make the playoffs in the AFC. Do you see any value there uh, based on a similar angle? Yeah, I think, you, I think that's a fine bet. I'd rather just bet them to win the Super Bowl, though, because – I think once they get in the playoffs, uh, you have a very hedgeable number, like Cody likes to say. So I I think I'd just rather shoot for the upside, but definitely don't hate that angle. I mean, this is a playoff team. Like, Schwartz, I know you have a lot of things that you dislike about Josh Allen and the Bills team, but I don't even think you would disagree. This is a playoff caliber team, right? Uh, I mean, in a vacuum, yeah, they may have dug themselves too much of a hole, and this is a very competitive AFC, so I don't know that they'll get there, but... Yeah, this isn't a team that's like a, you know, dead upon arrival as soon as they hit the playoffs, if that's what happens, especially, I mean, there's so many tiebreakers. They oh. can even hop to the sixth seed. All of a sudden, you're not looking at the Chiefs or the Ravens anymore, or shoot, you might be because the Chiefs, Ravens, Dolphins, one of them has to be the three seed. This is a tough AFC, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Bills have the ability to make some noise if they're able to find the postseason. Josh is playing his best football, but... I think I've I've made my point clear on Josh. It's not that I don't think he can do good stuff. Even in the macro, I think it all smooths out to some pretty good numbers. But he's just his mistakes come in clusters, and in the postseason, that's not okay. You don't get to have a good run of four games on average. You have to have four good games, great games consecutively, or it's over. So I don't think they're going to win the Super Bowl, even if they do get in. But you're right that forty-five to one is tremendously hedgeable the second they get in because they're not going to be. Even if they're playing a top seed, they're not going to be plus five hundred or anything. It's the Buffalo Bills, with Josh Allen. No, they'll be they'll be near a pick'em. I think if they play the Chiefs or the Ravens in the first round. Um, the other thing, the other thing too, is the Chiefs. We talked about it. Have a lot of issues on offense. The Ravens are without Mark Andrews. I think that hampers their offensive upside. Dolphins. We haven't had a chance to talk about this week though. But I'm really rising on them in the AFC race. But I don't think this is a gauntlet of an AFC as we thought at, at one point earlier in the season. And the, the Jaguars too, not to mention, Char we, we don't know about Trevor Lawrence's status of the ankle injury. So and there's an opportunity here. 
uh, for the Bills. But Cody, any other thoughts here? I mean, they're literally like one game behind the fifth seed. We're we're potentially talking them getting a first round matchup against the Jags or I the Jags if they manage to hold on to their spot or um the Texans or or even the Colts the Colts oh what? wow oh man put my I wouldn't even have to do anything my 20 my 200 to 1 and my 40 to 1 or whatever I'd get the bills at that just that'd be a dream I could just get one of those in the second round automatically um yeah I, I just man I just don't know if I want to wait a week or not uh, just see because like I said if they don't beat the Chiefs you're probably not being the te- the cowboy like it, the dream would be dead I, I think that the odds would move as soon as they beat the Chiefs. I think the odds would move the second they beat the Chiefs. I mean, we saw what happened to the Jalen Hurts MVP market after that game. I think people still hold these Chiefs in way too high of a regard just because of what they've done rather than what they are. I think you'd see the Bills' odds. Uh, I mean, they wouldn't like come all the way down, but I don't think you'd get anything close to a 45 again if they're able to win at Arrowhead. Oh, if, 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 they, win, if they win this week, you're not seeing this number again. Um, because that would put them right back in the playoff picture. But if they lose this week, you might see a way better number. So if you disagree with me and you think the Chiefs well, win this game, the issue is right. it depends on the others. If, if, they lose if the week, Steelers, if, if, if everyone else wins and maintains their spot too, that's why I said this number might still just hover around 40 is my guess. It will dip if they obviously win, but I don't yeah. know. Um, I, th- I The more I keep like thinking about this, I think actually this week probably would be the week to buy them. But I don't know. It's definitely something I'm going to be digging into. Um, I'm going to take a look at my portfolio, then uh, then we'll we'll make a decision here. Yeah, I think the bills are alive uh, moving forward. So that'll do it for us. Schwartz, any final thoughts before we get out of here? No, uh, this is an int- this is honestly a quietly interesting week. There's a lot of games that we could look back at as ones that shaped this season. So super excited to see how it all goes. Wish there were more starting quarterbacks healthy, but this is going to be a fun football weekend. It always is. Yeah, should be a great Sunday slate. Hope you guys enjoy. Hopefully we can bring you some winning picks on this show. Stay tuned for our Sunday slate player prop video that comes out on Sunday morning. Shorts and I will have you covered with some more player prop picks for this week. Been on a nice run over there. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, Stay tuned for our Monday night football coverage as well. Two Monday night football games this week. And that'll do it for us. Hope you guys enjoy the games and we'll catch you on the next one.